Hello, listeners. Thank you so much for returning to us on Generational Archives. We are so happy and thankful for you. This is the show where we connect, heal, uncover through intergenerational conversations and archival research. We generally focus on one person within our family and talk about the methods that we use to discover more about them. My name is Dr. Reina De Leon. I am one of the co-hosts, part of the mother-daughter team, with my mother, Dr. Norma D. Thomas. And we've started to integrate a practice of doing a check-in. So mommy offered this question, which was, why do you say you were spoiled? So mommy, why did you pose that question for us? I don't know. I was thinking about a question, and I know I would describe to people that my children were not spoiled. And somewhere out of the blue, both of you told me the exact opposite, that you were spoiled growing up. So I thought we'd start today with why do you say you were spoiled? I think, so I'll talk about the actual definition of spoiled in a moment, but spoiled being that we could uplift any concerns and you would engage in the pulling from the sky of magic money to <laughs> make it all happen. And they actually described it as magic money. Yes, absolutely. Mommy can find magic money. Yes. And so it might have been like physical you have saved all the pennies and we have counted the pennies and put it put them into the penny rolls and now we're taking the penny rolls to school to get our pretzels with everybody else. Whatever it was, if I said I wanted 20 books off of that elastic list one year, you were going to make it happen, generally. Every now and then you'd be like, edit, Raina, edit. <laughs> but our our desires were fully supported. And I remember you once being like, yeah, we, we might have had some instances along the, uh, along the way that we were moving the cars so that the repo man wouldn't take them. <laughs> that was true. <laughs> <laughs> but... As far as like the support for nurturing our dreams, for sure. Um, but of course, now the, the actual definition of spoiled is harmed in character by being treated too leniently or indulgently. And if we go with that actual definition, I don't think that we were spoiled. I don't think we were harmed in character by being treated too leniently. Um, I, I think in our household, there was a great regard for discussion and listening. And we didn't have some of the rules that other people had. A, a friend of mine was asking about if we had um, uh, uh, curfews and that kind of thing. Not really. Um, I remember going to in high school to my best friend's house, my sister's house, and, and like disappearing for a few days. <laughs> and... Being like, yeah, I'm just going to go to school because we went to the same school. And, um, you know, being over there watching, you know, The Wizard of Oz for the gazillionth time <laughs> there or listening to another album from Mariah Carey. And you would just call over and be like, oh, she's there? Okay, great. So everything's fine. Whereas I, a lot of my friends had a lot more um, control over, like, where you go and who you go with. So, um, but do you think that you were spoiled? No, we were definitely not spoiled. There were six of us in the same household, although I have an older sister who grew up down south. So the six of us in the same household, we were not spoiled. We had separation of duties in terms of the house and clothes and and cleaning. My brother, uh, these duties were separated by gender. So my brother had the yard work and the trash and all those kinds of things. But he also helped us do dishes. I think he actually had to help iron. So we we had these roles. They were very strictly enforced. You could not go out on Saturday night yeah. and then Sunday morning say you're not going to church because you're going to get up and go to church on Sunday morning. And so there were the only one that we ever described as spoiled is my youngest sister. <laughs> and, and she's the only one that we can remember that actually had a birthday party because they would forget our birthdays. It would be like, oh, yeah, your birthday was last week. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> so we, you know, the whole birthday party thing, uh, my youngest sister got the birthday parties and all that stuff. 
and she says that we always say she was spoiled as a babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I recall that you know you couldn't even have your own birthday. Birthdays got confused all the time. As oh I recall. yes, well they they did get confused. So my uh, next to the youngest sister, we celebrated her birthday on the wrong day for years. My dad used to work in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which was several hours away from where we lived. So he would leave on Sunday and come back on Friday. And one of those times must have been when we were celebrating Carla's birthday. And he said, Your, her birthday is not today. It was yesterday. And we were like, what are you talking about? This is, and of course, my mother is there too. So Hilarious. she has it wrong too. And then he would go get the birth certificate. And then, so now I never, I don't know whether my sister's birthday is February 5th or 6th. So if I'm going to send a card, I have to send it early. I'm probably going to be late because in my head it's one day, but it's actually the other day. Or now I'll see on Facebook, uh, you know, I'm wishing my mother a happy birthday. Oh my gosh, I have to call my sister because um, yesterday was her birthday. <laughs> See, that's the mother of a lot of babies, because I certainly remember the birthdays of my babies, um, but I only have two. So, Well, we're going to talk about how that plays out further when we talk about today's subject. So let's get to it. Today's subject, we're going to talk about process and how to begin. Mommy, you said several times that the way to begin ancestral research is to actually start with yourself. And so what does that mean? Well, and this is a follow-up to a TikTok live we did yesterday. We were on the Tiki Talk. Yes. So this morning I was, I was saying, what do we record? And I said, well, let's go back to process. So the, the easiest thing to do is to start with yourself. Pull together all the documents that you can find about who you are. This is not to make yourself out to be some great, wonderful person, but it is to start the historical legacy about who you are and then going outward. And so I have collected as much information as I have been able to gather about me as a young child and then going outward. So I told my daughter, I'm sitting in front of these two massive five-inch binders, I have to split them again because they're overcrowded and go to a third. So my life has been reduced to these two five-inch binders, um, soon to be a third. But, but taking this information chronologically and going, going backwards to see what you can find about your own origin story. And so I have information about legal records and legal documents and how they could be wrong even in my own circumstance. Well, and so gathering those things like birth certificates, of course, but also we've mentioned before, especially on the Tiki Talk, um, I, I don't know why I like to say Tiki Talk more than TikTok, but uh, cr creating a, 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 a documentation of one's own baby pictures and, you know, sometimes your people don't want to give up all the pictures of you as a baby. Mommy was saying the other day, I want to look at some of those pictures from that time. But one of the gifts for me and my brother was a repository, an album of many of our baby pictures. So do you know where your baby pictures are? It's a good question. Do you have some? Have you shared them with your people, with your, with your children, if you are um, mothering or, or parenting? So thinking about starting with that, um, even pictures and birth certificates, it's fascinating too around your birth certificate and what you learned about your own name, mommy. So what is this story about your name? Well, my, my name, again, another one of these occasions when my father came home from Newcastle, Pennsylvania, I was literally filling out college applications. And writing my name, Norma Deborah, D E B R A Thomas. He said, That is not your name. I said, You have lost your mind. <laughs> what do you mean this is not my name? He goes to get my birth certificate. My name is Norma, essentially Deborah, D E B O R A H Thomas. 
And I said, it's too late now because <laughs> my driver's license, everything concerning me is Norma, D-E-B-R-A, and nobody has ever caught this. In addition, I was saying to Raina, because I've always used my original name, when I got married for a little while, I hyphenated it, but people would always turn it around. So Thomas Leon would be Leon Tom. You know, it was just, I just got tired of the confusion. So... I dropped the Leon, and I've always been Norma Thomas, except on a couple of official documents because for two years after I got married, between the IRS and Social Security, it was at a time when women generally took their husband's name, I fought with them over needing to change to a new Social Security card with a, with a, a new name and also changing my name with the IRS. Finally, I lost that battle or I decided to give up because it wasn't worth fighting these big government organizations. So the issue wasn't an issue until I applied for Medicare and Social Security. And so they did have this uh, Norma D. Leon, although my whole professional life I've used Norma D. Thomas. So I don't know how they reconcile that. I get my statements. It says Norma Thomas on those statements. But for medical purposes, Norma Leone, I had to start using that with my Medicare. And so that occasionally causes confusion because when I go to medical appointments, sometimes I forget that I have to sign things Norma D. Leone. So another case where I just said to Raina, maybe I need to get my own official original Social Security application, because I'm curious as to whether it says Norma D-E-B-R-A or Norma D-E-B-O-R-A-H on that application. So sexism of the IRS and the Social Security requiring you to change your identification to the male within the household, the patriarchy. And I also appreciate how you resisted the patriarchy I, too, have not changed my name to a married name. My mother-in-law never changed hers either. And yet, often, even within my own family, I get uh, cards with my husband's last name on it. And I'm like, who is that person? I don't know who that person is. <laughs> like, I, I was born to this name. I'm not changing this name. But I think it's important for this conversation around naming and document. And I love that part of this story, too is that Grandpa continually calls uh, you and, your, and the family back to the truth of the matter. Oh, that's the wrong birthday. Oh, that's the wrong name. And, and you have a story, too, about who you think you're named after. Yes, uh, and I was going to tell that story because sometimes names in families, you see them repeated in the, yes. in the family. And uh, my brother named Philip is one of those that is repeated in the family history. But mine wasn't. And I, when my sister was getting married for, uh, this was her second marriage, we were all at her house, and next day is the wedding, and we're all celebrating. And I don't know the context for why this story came up, but my father started to talk about this woman named Norma Minor. And he talked about her with such affection. And he's going on about this woman named Norma Minor, so much so that I leaned to one of my siblings and said, I think that's where my name came from. <laughs> and I didn't have the courage at the time that, to confirm it. But when my father became caretaker of Clearview Cemetery, the only he had the names of everyone listed in the graveyard, but the only pictures that he had when I was going through the possessions was the gravesite of Norma Minor and mm -hmm. I assume her husband. And so whatever his connection were to the, was to these people, I am very convinced that's where my name came from. So Minor family, if you know anything about our um, father, grandfather, Edward Thomas and Norma Minor, we'd love to hear that story. Um, who knows if this uh, podcast may make its way to them. Well, I am putting together the binders about myself. I started clearly with birth certificates. 
So I was born in Columbus, Georgia at Fort Benning when my father was in the military. About a year after uh, his, after being in the military, well, soon after his, my birth, they brought me back to Uniontown, Pennsylvania to stay with my grandmother. And I stayed with her for a year until he was discharged out of the military. So he was discharged one year to the date after I was born in 1954. So he, that's when we came back to, or they came back to Uniontown, Pennsylvania. In terms of pictures, I think there are maybe five pictures of me from baby to maybe four or five years old. One, I am actually in a high chair. I used to think this was my great-grandfather's house, but given the timing, it was probably my grandmother's house. And so I'm in a high chair. There's a picture with me and my parents that I know was up on Park Avenue, which was my great-grandparents' house. We lived there for a time while my dad and grandfather built our house because that house, I think they bought the property in 54 the porch had 55 as the date when the porch was completed. So I, I believe we lived up on the hill for a, a, some period of time. There is a picture that I'm looking at now with me standing in front of a car all dressed up and one with one of my cousins. So I, there, and the one with my grandmother and my uncle where my grandmother is holding me. So that's like five pictures of the first many years of my life, probably up to five years old. And that's uh, reinforcing making sure that you give your children some of their baby pictures. Because sometimes these things just do not survive mm -hmm. and, and people do not have them. I, I have not seen one picture of my husband as a baby. Yeah. So they disappear. And please give your children, grandchildren. Uh, one of the gifts I give my grandchildren because I yeah. don't give them toys. These children don't need no toys. <laughs> so I give them money, but every two years I do an album for them of their pictures. And mm -hmm. so they will have their baby pictures forever because yes. I put them all together, big albums, and, and give them when my um, granddaughter was two, she got hers. My grandson now has two. Mm -hmm. because he's four and so that's my gift to them well it's also something for all of you in this time where we take so many pictures digitally and don't print them out so inviting you to think about going back to some of those digital files and printing them out for um, your children for your family and putting them in places because technology is what technology is y'all and back up and back up and back up again and share the wonderful thing about digital technology is that you can share so widely and, you know, think about 20, 30 years from now where your children don't have access to that phone or that cloud-based program or whatever it is. They, they might want to also see pictures of themselves as little ones and, and what can you give them? Can you give them the hard copy that they can put into a frame and, and share with their people and, and be reminded of or will you give them your phone that you can't open anymore because it was 20 years ago. So, Well, and that's uh, an aside because we talk about making sure all your legal documents yes. are in order, but you're supposed to also make sure your digital uh, files you give access to someone because, again, once you're gone and nobody knows the passwords, how do people get in to see these photos and all those things? So. It's also something to think about that we often do not think about. One of the reasons I have some early documents is we talked about this yesterday. Like Raina, my dad was a keeper. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how much of a keeper he was until after he died. Because the upstairs did not look like anything out of the ordinary. I mean, he had, there's a, a comedian that talks about, you know, uh, your your characteristics by if you have a perfectly good TV on top of a TV that doesn't work <laughs> or if you have cars that are outside on blocks. And so that was us. 
my we had a big floor model, you know, TV, but it didn't work. So on top of it was another TV. But my dad, you know, so that stuff was upstairs. But it wasn't until we got to the basement that we saw the extent of his being a keeper. And one of the things he kept were our immunization records from when we were children. He had our baptismal records. He had our promotion records in Sunday school. <laughs> so we saw all this stuff from when we were, were children. I said after he died, I going through his stuff, I'm sending my siblings all their documents and they're finally like don't send any more of this stuff and I said but it's yours so I'm sending do it with it as you please but I have my Sunday school promotions I have my baptismal records I I had all my immunization so it was it was wonderful he had kept certificates that I hadn't kept about driving school and apparently I looked this morning I graduated from a civil defense Thing. That must have been a thing back then when they had the bomb shelters and, and things. So I had eight hours of civil defense training. Wow. Okay. <laughs> in high school. We want you to be on the zombie apocalypse team. Uh, apparently. So apparently. I had a driver's education, all those things that he had kept that probably would not have been important to me at the time. And then, so there's a, a gap with some things that I appeared where I didn't keep. And then, but I've gone back to every graduation, every award, letters that have been written to me, letters that have been written to me by students, especially ones that are particularly heartfelt. Mm. And I have kept those. I, I, I still get them occasionally over the years. I had a student reach out to me who's now retiring. And I was her field supervisor for her bachelor's and master's degree. And at her retirement Zoom party, she told me all the lessons oh, I taught her. And I said, you know, that sounds like me. At one point, I told her she needed to get her life together <laughs> because she was just messing up too much. And, and she said, I listened to that, and I got my life together, and I got that master's degree, and you agreed to be my field supervisor, even though I was messing up <laughs> when I was the undergrad. So... Those, all those things I have kept over the years. And again, not to promote myself, but because it's my legacy yes. and someone else can go back and look at these things and, and um, feel a sense of wonder because I always, education was very pushed, especially by my mother. I don't know that my father would, would have been as disappointed if I didn't go on the higher education, but I know my mother would have because she had always wanted to go and get her college degree, which she was able to do a year before she died. So that was very, 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 very important. And where I come from, African-American doctors, mm. people with doctorate degrees, you can count us on one hand that I know about. And, and so we were, none of us were destined to, that was not our, no one would have thought that would have been our trajectory, except especially my mother. That was her trajectory for all of us. Mm. She didn't get to see me achieve that doctorate, but I know she was up there smiling when yeah. I was able to do that. So it is really good to put all this stuff together for people who look like me, who think they can't do what I did. Of course you can. Of course you can. It takes some perseverance. It takes a village. It takes community support. It takes people being behind you. But you can accomplish all of this. But it's interesting occasionally to go back like the civil defense thing. I don't even know what that was. <laughs> but I did it for eight hours. So that's a lot of time. It is a lot of and time. And I got a certificate in it. So I don't know what that was about, but, you know, that was the Cold War. Yeah. And so somewhere this had to do with being prepared for the apocalypse. Well, and I, I want to uplift a few things that you've just spoken to, that it's not about ego. It is about legacy. And I want to offer to you listeners that you are worthy of an archive that your people are worthy of an archive, of being remembered, of being celebrated, of being seen for the fullness of who they are. And sometimes that ain't pretty. But 
they should be seen because all of who they are has impacted all of who we are, right, in this moment and will impact the future. How we deal with that information is up to us. But archive is important. Again, it's not about the ego. It's about legacy and it's about community. And I also want to uplift one thing that you spoke to, even in connection with um, the uh, civil defense training, <laughs> but more so with, you know, black folks where you come from, Fayette County, Uniontown area, rural Appalachia, were not expected by, um, or, or envisioned to be doctors of whatever. And that there are few, but they are. Um, and that they have achieved, and, and um, Grandma had that vision for her children, and and I'm sure many folks have visions for uh, their people achieving whatever their dreams are. Community is how we thrive, right? And what you spoke to of like this wasn't just my success; it is my whole community's success of supporting this particular dream to come to fruition. And what is my dream? I want to offer as an example for others who dream the same that this is possible. So again, confirming, uplifting that for you all who are listening, if that is your dream, it is possible. Who are your people? Gather your people because community is how we thrive. And I said my, my, my father did not necessarily push the higher education. He would have accepted us whatever we mm. did. My mother was not going to accept not <laughs> going on to higher education. But one of the reasons I went on to get my doctorate is a conversation I overheard with my father and one of his cousins, my cousins, uh, one of the Ellis's uh, from Connecticut. And he's on the, the front porch. I'm in the living room. And he says, I don't know why that girl stopped going on the wow. school. Yeah. That she got her master's and then she stopped. And she didn't go on to get her doctorate. And I sat there saying, I didn't even think that mattered to him. Mm. And I was in the process. Uh, well, it's not the process. I applied to a doctoral program at University of Penn or started the application three times and didn't finish it. Specifically because I got in my head that I probably can't do this. So on one hand, I must have thought I could, and then in the midst, decided I could. So a friend of mine heard me talking about getting ready to do this the fourth time, but maybe, maybe I won't do it. It all coincided with my dad this time saying he doesn't know why I didn't keep going. Mm. And then that friend encouraging me to talk to someone over at the University of Pennsylvania who I did complete the application. She read the application. I asked her to give me some feedback. And she said, what took you so long? We yeah. have been waiting for you. Mm. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, I had all this self-doubt. We can talk ourselves out of anything. We can talk ourselves into it, but we can talk ourselves out of anything. And that's literally what Ornice said. We have been waiting for you. And I... then, then she said, we mu you must be a procrastinator. And I <laughs> said, generally, I'm not. But this is one I had so much self-doubt that if my friend Lois hadn't reached out, I'd have probably thrown this application away again. I, I love that. What took you so long? We have been waiting for you. Y'all, listeners. Imagine your highest hope, your biggest dream, and at the other side of that, meeting someone who can offer an opening into that, them saying, what took you so long? We have been waiting for you. We have been waiting for you. And perhaps that's the message that you need to hear in this moment of, and I hope that this podcast reaches those who need it in this moment of, oh yeah, that thing that I've been talking myself out of, no, I have to stop taking so long because someone is waiting for me to step into that space. And I'd also add that putting all of this together, I mentioned this in previous podcasts, I wasn't spurred to begin this process until after my father died. Mm. So don't wait that long because mm. he could have given me such, and, and my mother, such tremendous information that would have made this journey easier because he would have known 
a lot of what we are now trying to reconstruct. So do it now. Don't wait. Just do it now. I don't know when I put the binders together for you and your brother. You mm, would have had yeah. to have been in high school or have graduated. I don't know. But it would have been, you would have been 15 when my dad died. So I know it was after that point. Right. And so probably starting to put mine together, I decided I have all this stuff on you all too. Mm -hmm. You all need the same binders that yeah. document your early history with report cards. I, I, my high school report card is here. Luckily, the final grades keep show the subjects are all faded out now, but the final grades are there. But your report cards, the, the pictures that you all took every year in, in, in elementary school, you had those little yearbooks mm -hmm. and all of that is there. I actually gave you all the tapes from when you danced. Yep. I don't know what you did with uh, those. I'm a keeper. I still have them. But they need to be like legacy box or something. You, you yeah. need to get those converted. But all those things, uh, people need their stuff too. And so hold, you holding on to, the, to their things as parents or guardians is wonderful. But at some point, the individuals themselves need to get copies of their own information well you know the other day i was watching judge judy who i love to watch i know you love to watch the court shows too i do um and judge judy was even a part of my birth story perhaps a um, birthing story with my son that's a story for another day but i was watching judge judy actually it was judy justice now i was watching the most right. recent one and there was a a figure on a, a person on the um show who was talking about um his father had passed away. The, the court dispute was around property that mm -hmm. had been disposed of. Right. And, um, and there, there's a house, all that. It doesn't matter the house. What he was mourning were the loss of particular items from like, that had sentimental value to him. And the judge said over and over again, well, if they mattered to you while your father was alive, you visited. Why didn't you get him? Why didn't you get I him? I saw that one. And what he said over and over was, my father was a stable place. He, he, he kept all of his, his children's things with him. And so that was a tension with, oh, um, taking the things that really mattered to him. And I think about when we got the book ourselves, our, our binders, my, my brother and I, it was when we were stable because I was mm -hmm. moving around a lot. Right, right, right. And so getting the, the book, that I want to say that you sent it to me, but I was already living in California, I think, when I had received my binders of, like, my whole life um, because I had been moving from, um, from Pennsylvania down to North Carolina to Nevada to Germany, then to California, and I was there for a while, and that's when I got these books when I was in my 30s. Um, because movement, right? And so I think, though, whatever it is that you value in your people's house, if it is of sentimental value, gather it. Take care of it. Don't trust that it will always be waiting for you. Well, and in the case of your father and pictures that may have existed, you, yeah. I think, talked about the fact that in my mother-in-law, Raina's grandmother's house, there was a flood. Yes. And so a lot of things just became destroyed. Yes. And there's nothing you can do about that. Total devastation when I realized that. Um, my, I've mentioned before, but my, great, my grandfather was a merchant marine and also photographer. He took this uh, his camera with him everywhere, all of, around the world. And I remember as a child seeing some of the photo albums from those printed prints and remembering that they were family, but also of his travels in their home in um, quite, um, in, you know, in the projects in Philly before. And it was filled with all these treasures from his tra travels, like elephant sculptures from mm -hmm, india and mm -hmm. um all these incredible things so the pictures were also vibrant um black and white and when my grandmother transitioned i went to the house and was like i will take the pictures of these things and share them with all my cousins so that we all have them um because you know it again the all these items of sentimental value for our entire family were held within one home and now that primary caretaker was gone and so for me i was like okay let's make sure that everyone 
has access to these materials. And my aunt shared at that time, oh, they were stored at one point in the basement. There was this flood. And here are all the ones that are left. So the albums that I remember that were stacked upon one another had gone down to about 40 pictures and envelopes. And so I took pictures of those and shared them with my cousins and email and with my uncle and email and all of my aunts and uncles whose email address I had, again, sharing the, the resources of those times and even spent some time with my, my aunt my, um, to go through who is this person and how are they related to us? I need to do that again. But thinking about, again, don't rely on those treasures, those sentimental um, memories, those repositories of memories, rather, to always remain in that place. My, one of the things you said we might do is go back and look at pictures. Because my brother, he lived with my father when my father yes. died. So he has pictures from that era. And to go back, because occasionally he'll, he'll mention that, oh, I have that picture. And I, I'm like, you do? And so we need to go back and look at those. My uncle has asked me for pictures of great aunts and uncles. Some of them I have, some of them I don't, which has prompted me to see if I can find pictures of them and be able to pass them on. So those are important. I, I talked about possibly when we talked about my Aunt Doris, who was an entertainer, that I saw the albums that she had not only the gowns and all the clothes from being in the entertainment industry, but she had massive albums because we used to talk about her, that she stole everybody's pictures. <laughs> and you could see on the back of the pictures, those old black photo albums that they had been ripped off of somebody else's <laughs> photo album. So we always talked about the fact that she stole people's pictures. But yet none of us know where those pictures are her son is deceased many years her grandchildren now doing a lot of research i found that they, they're deceased so maybe not all of them but some of them so i have no idea what happened to all that material and again mm -hmm. it may now totally be lost yeah so is there anything else you want to offer to our listeners today mommy no i i would just say start early mm -hmm. start with yourself it's important to preserve your own legacy because as I used to say to my students who would say, oh, I don't like to talk about myself. I don't, I don't want to write this evaluation, you know, and, and say these things about myself. And I would always say, if you don't talk well about yes. yourself, who will? Exactly. You have to be able to be able to talk about your own greatness. So mm. it is it is wonderful to be able to put together your legacy. And Raina mentioned, even if you're if if your past is not ideal, it is not where you would have wanted it to be, and you turned your life around, or there are things in the past that that are upsetting. One of the lessons we have learned about talking to elders is the way you reconcile your life is to be able to talk about all the experiences of your life because mm. they all make who you are. What are the lessons that you can pass on to children and grandchildren so that they don't go down the path mm. you went down? How did you turn your life around? What would you, what would you do differently if you had the opportunity? And being able to talk about those things and give advice to other people helps people at the end of life as well. So you, you are who you are. You can't change who you are. Uh, secrets will come to light. Mm. So we think we bury secrets. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> when you're gone, they come out. So we might as well be the, um, the captains of our own story mm -hmm. and tell our own story because it's our story. Right. And so don't let other people tell your story. Tell your own story. And so you can put your own spin on that story, and people can understand the, the path that you went to get to be who you are. And if you have regrets, you can talk about those yes. regrets. But if you've had uplifting experiences, you can talk about because we all have regrets. Right. All of us wish we would have done something on a given day. But 
I think I'm pushing us not to have so many of those regrets mm. so that we pass those pictures along. We talk about our stories. We put together who we are and we don't get to be 90 and can't remember a lot of these things anymore. Yes. And then we say, I wish I would have. Well, isn't that a wonderful gift too to the future of even recording yourself once or twice or however many times. Yeah, Rain and I have I have a tape from a radio show that Rain and I ah, did. Ah, yes, that's true. Um, you know, telling a story and being in conversation so that others can experience the fullness of your story and your voice and the way you speak and offer your wisdom into the world. So I, I want to, I don't want to forget what you just said, which I found myself in a vocal affirmation about. You have to be able to talk about your own greatness, y'all. Like that's a whole word. Like that's a word. Y'all need to. Everybody needs to write that on a, on something, a post it, put it somewhere. You have to be able to talk about your own greatness. How have you talked about your greatness today? Again, it is not about ego. It is about legacy, right? Um, and I also really appreciate how you said around um, the reconciling with yourself and being able to speak to all the the vibrant experiences of one's life. So as we close, I want to uplift to some questions of um, where are your baby pictures? Where are those things that bring you joy and hold memory? Do you have access to them? How do you gain access? How do you share access? What's your name story? Um, mm. You know, where did that come from? Reina's name in Spanish means queen. And my mother's first name was queen. Yep. I'm named after my grandparents. Um, so, you know, totally poignant that we're talking about ancestors, right? Um, printing out your digital pictures and sharing those with your people. Uh, thinking about creating legacy. So one of the things that mommy spoke to was her tradition of creating these albums for my children every two years that are printouts of their pictures, of their development over time. How are you creating and sharing legacy again? Um, even thinking about like uh, holding holding materials that perhaps might not be poignant at the time, but could be in the future. So those yearbooks, keep them. Um, your report cards, your kids' report card, keep them. You never know looking back of like, oh, this informs a lot of how I understand the world. Even looking back at my elementary school yearbook, I was like, wow, our school was pretty diverse. I, I don't remember it that way, but apparently it, it, it had a, a, some... Uh, some cultural diversity there. That's pretty exciting. Um, but thinking back to those items and looking at the past through them, what is revealed on how you remember what's complicated by it. So we want to thank you so much for listening again to Generational Archives, a podcast again where we are connecting and healing and uncovering through intergenerational conversations and archival research. I'm Dr. Reina J. Leon, and I'm with Dr. Norma D. Thomas, my mother. And I, any last words that you want to offer to folks, mommy? No, no last words. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. So keep um, following. And um, if you like what you've heard, support us on Patreon, um, just on Generational Archives as well. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. And you can listen wherever you listen. Share the news with folks if you think that folks can benefit from the story and the processes. And next time, who knows what we're going to talk about. I was thinking about <laughs> uh, uh, mothering stories. Who knows? Who knows? Or birthing stories, rather. Do you know your birth story? Ah. Um, so that could be fun. But we'll see where we go. We'll see where we go. And please come along with us. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.